Hi, everyone. Welcome to my session on InfluxDB Cloud Durability. My name is Phil Brasikowski. I'm the tech lead and a senior software engineer on the storage team at Influx Data. InfluxDB Cloud offers customers moving from open source or self-hosted InfluxDB several benefits. Two that I'll be focusing on today is that Influx Data is responsible for the durability of your data and maintaining backups for disaster recovery. So in this session, you learn how Cloud2 replicates your data to these purposes. I'll begin by making a comparison of InfluxDB open source and cloud, and then move to how we replicate data in cloud, looking at the synchronous half and the asynchronous half. And finally, I'll share some numbers about cloud in production. I hope by the end of this presentation, you have an understanding of the storage architecture and ingest flow, and how cloud replicates your data, creates backups, and recovers from a few example failure scenarios. So what's the worst fear for a database company? I'll give you a few seconds to figure it out. But it's right in the name. It's losing data. So we go to great lengths so that we never lose your data. And this walkthrough is going to show you how we do that. So let's begin our walkthrough. As I said, I'm going to start with InfluxDB open source. It's free software, so you can do whatever you like with it. But to use it, you're going to download it, install it, configure it, run it, define your buckets and schema, and move into what I'm calling the value cycle, where you write data and query your data back, and that's where you get value for your business. But in addition for open source, you need to monitor it, operate it, scale it, purchase hardware, create backups, and in the unfortunate but inevitable case of a disaster, recover from those backups. These extra functions are not really extra. They're essential features for a production database, and they're non-trivial. With InfluxDB open source, you're in full control, and you have full flexibility. You can download the open source code, make changes for your business needs as you require. So you're an expert in your business, and you become an expert in operating InfluxDB. If that's not for you, there's InfluxDB Cloud. The getting started is faster. You just sign up, define your buckets and schema, and more quickly enter the value cycle with less responsibilities for yourself. You get to write your data and query it just as before, deriving value for your business. Kind of make it more explicit, let's put open source and cloud side by side for what you're responsible for. So those other responsibilities that I said were non-trivial and important, they're handled by us. They're handled by my team. We take care of the monitoring, the operating, and the scaling, the creation of backups, and the recovery when needed. You know, this is a typical trade-off in a cloud software service. You get to focus on your business, and we handle everything else. My team are the experts in running InfluxDB Cloud. There are 12 of us that have a round-the-clock call schedule. The lessons we learn from one customer, we can apply to benefit all customers. And we're continuously making improvements to the storage layer that benefit you seamlessly. While I wish, well, I actually don't wish, but I wish uh, and would like to have a session uh, that cover all the parts here, monitoring, scaling, and operating. But today, in this session, I'm just going to cover how your data writes enter in FluxDB Cloud, how we create backups, I'll go through a few example uh, recovery scenarios, as I mentioned. And through this process, I'll explain what kind of data replication we have. On the right path, on getting your data in, one important part there is that your data eventually becomes queryable. And I want to stress that eventuality, and I'll come back to it later in my session today. As I mentioned, I'm going to be starting with the open source architecture, which is represented here on this diagram. At this high abstraction level, uh, it's a very good fit for open source and also a good fit for cloud. And I'll, we'll see the differences in cloud as we go through. I'll be necessarily brief today, but if you want more information, you should check out my colleague Jacob Marble's 2019 Influx Days presentation, where he goes into a lot more detail on this diagram. So starting on the left, you will send a write payload to our write endpoint, likely through one of our clients, such as Telegraph or Python. And if you are seeing Maya's presentation on API later, she uses the Python client to do just this. Once Cloud receives it at the right endpoint, we validate, authorize, and replicate your data into the write-ahead log, or wall, which is a persistent append-only buffer optimized for accepting data quickly. That data isn't durable until we have a system call, fsync, that puts it on disk. At that point, we have durability. To the right, then, our time series database engine, or storage engine, I'll also call it shard later in this presentation, reads from the write ahead log and transforms your data into a format that's optimized for querying. And likewise, again, 
F-syncs that to disk, making it disk durable. We can kind of think of this diagramming as having two parts, a left and a right. The left half is going to be synchronous, and the right half is going to be asynchronous. That important split um, will be a theme going forward in these diagrams. All right, so let's move to a diagram that's more representative of the cloud architecture, with a few more components to kind of show more complexity here. And while the open source version runs as a single binary, in cloud, we've kind of separated out components into different parts so that we can scale and operate them independently. Our cloud product runs on three cloud providers, AWS, GCP, Azure. And we run all of our services on Kubernetes as various replica sets and stateful sets. I'll begin by looking at the left half here, which is the synchronous part of cloud. So here's a zoomed in diagram of cloud, focusing on the synchronous half of the right pathway. You'll notice a few changes from the open source diagram. First off, we've replaced the flat file wall with a Kafka wall, and we rely significantly on guarantees from Kafka. We've configured it with 3x replication over several cloud availability zones. This configuration is called minimum in sync replicas. And while our total replication will be three, the minimum we set is two. And what this means is that your write payload will have been replicated at least two times and F sync to the network disks attached to Kafka before your write client receives an acknowledgment. This whole process is synchronous. So your write client will be hanging out, waiting for cloud to validate, shard, and replicate your data before it gets that 200 series status code success back. Additionally, we configure Kafka with a rolling four days retention period. This means we're keeping 96 hours of the most recent writes that have come into cloud. We also make sure all the network desks attached to Kafka are large enough for that four days worth of data. As a third thing, we copy everything in the wall to object store as an out of bound backup. This backup process runs about an hour behind the head of the wall. Backups are segmented by customer, bucket, shard, and date time of ingest. This bears repeating. We've organized the data by time of ingest. This means we can only service a certain type of recovery request from the out of bound backup. So if you ask me to restore data that you wrote on September 10th, I can certainly do that. But if you ask me to restore all the data that has timestamps between September 1st and September 10th, I cannot do that. So to recap, for this synchronous half of the diagram, you will only receive a write acknowledgment once your data write has been replicated at least two times within Kafka, which is our write ahead log. And then within at most an hour, your data will be replicated now for a total of four times, three times within Kafka, and once also through the out-of-bound backup in the object store. And then to really make sure we don't lose data, we've configured Object Store and all of our CSPs to have multi-zone replication. So that can be up to six times total for the most recent four days worth of data. All right, that covers the first half of the diagram. Looking back at the overall architecture diagram for Cloud2, we're now going to shift to the second half, the right side. Removing the components that we, I won't be talking about today, I can redraw it in this form, which shows Kafka, storage engine shard, and then object store again, but now for different data. Briefly, the ingester represented here is a Kafka consumer that transforms the sharded data in the wall into a format that's optimized for querying. This is either TSM or Parquet. This is a different file format than what the wall uses and a different file format from the wall backups. These query optimized files are additionally pushed into object store and fetched as needed by various storage engines to answer your queries. While I've only represented one storage engine shard here, you should imagine many. And additionally, for each one that you're imagining, there's a replica for each shard. So we run two replicas for every shard on top of Kubernetes. We do this so that we can perform code configuration deployments without losing progress on ingesting or responding to queries. We can take one replica offline, update it as we need, while the other replica is still online, answering queries and ingesting from the wall. When the shard that's been updated is completed, it's work, it returns to sharing the load with the first replica. So if you've been keeping track, we've added a few more copies now. So in addition to the wall format backup, we now have three more copies of your data in a query optimized format. One in object store, and one each on the two shards, on network volumes for those shards, for a total of three. Data in all these places we can kind of call hot since it's being actively queried. This data is more frequently updated and touched than that in the wall backups. It's being updated to account for retention policies, deletes that you initiate, duplicate data, and just generally all the new data that's coming in. 
We're constantly reorganizing this data so that it's optimized for queries and synchronizing it with object store so that we always have a reliable copy of the data that we've optimized for queries. So back to that synchronous asynchronous dichotomy. While the writes into Kafka are synchronous, the reading of that data that's in Kafka by the storage engine shards is asynchronous. This means that data is not immediately queryable by you. At the lowest level, we call this time delta between the write acknowledgment and when the storage shard could return your data in a query, the time to become readable, TTBR. This interval is typically around a half second, but that's a typical value. I will also note now that some query pathways involve schema caches that have a time to live of a few handfuls of minutes, maybe up to 15 at most. If your write has added a new measurement tag or field, you may have to wait until that cache's TTL expires before any query targeting those new schemas will respond with the data that you most recently wrote. And now I've combined all the backups and data copies into one diagram here so we can walk through a few failure scenarios and how we would recover from them. For instance, if we lose one storage replica, we can rebuild from the hot copy an object store and that in Kafka. This is sort of a normal situation, and that's why we have two replicas. Normal, I say, because sometimes we just need to replace the disk on one of these storage replicas. So we have to take it offline, destroy the network disk, and it rebuilds from object store and the Kafka wall. If we lose the hot data in object store, we can rebuild from the replicas themselves and additionally what's still in Kafka. I haven't seen object store failure yet, but it's always good to be prepared. If we lose all of the hot data, which would be a pretty extreme situation, we can build from the wall backup and Kafka. The wall backup, this out-of-bound backup, can be considered a master record today, but I have a caveat on that in a minute. If we lose part of Kafka, the 3x replication that we've configured for it has us well covered. We occasionally lose brokers just because you occasionally lose network disks. Once the disk is restored, Kafka will automatically re-replicate the data that is missing from the other brokers that are still healthy. If we lose all of Kafka, which would mean the simultaneous loss of matching network volumes in multiple availability zones. We can rebuild from the master wall backup with only about an hour's loss of data, which is the interval between the upload process from the wall to object store. And then returning to this case where we lose both storage replicas, what that does mean is that we won't be able to have query availability because you need at least one replica to respond to queries from that data. But the nice thing about the cloud architecture with separate components is that you can still continue to write your data in. We've made a point of trying to keep parts independent so that if one failure happens in, in an area, it doesn't propagate to another. And since this diagram shows all the replication of your data, it's also a nice place to show that we only bill you for one copy of it. While there's about seven copies here, we only bill you for the hourly average of the size of the data in the query optimized format. All right, now back to that caveat on the out-of-bound backup. Like I said, Today, it's kind of a master record because for the last two years of cloud, we've essentially kept all data from the beginning of time for a customer. So we could re do any recovery from them since they've been a customer. We're transitioning this fall to a system that only keeps about 100 days of wall backup. Additionally, in this new backup system, we have to keep weekly snapshots of the hot object store data, as you can see on this diagram. That's so we can still handle recovery in all those failure scenarios I walked through. The reason we're making this change is so that we can honor a customer delete within about that 100-day interval. This is for our own sanity, compliance, and because it just makes sense. If you ask us to delete some data, we're going to be actually deleting it, not only from the hot copy like we do today, but also all of our backups. But we're not deleting it so quickly that we can't help you recover from an accidental deletion or handle a disaster recovery. So cloud is maintaining this level of redundancy in 12 production regions across roughly 740 storage pods, 3,000 hot data files for 64,000 organizations and 222,000 buckets. This represents about 270 terabytes of hot TSM query data and 4.3 billion series keys. So we do all this and maintain all this with a team of approximately 12 development and operational engineers. So I hope this walkthrough has shown you how we have a robust backup system that will keep you from losing data. And if you're not a customer yet, helps convince you that cloud is the right place for your time series data. I hope you find me in the Infox community Slack at any time for questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you.